Amen. Thank you. Be seated. full of silver and gold. I think that'll make sense to you when we get to the end of the message. Here's a question to think about. What is your price to get you to turn from God? Let's turn to Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. What is your price to get you to turn from God? Numbers chapter 22, and I want to read verse 18. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now the story of Balak is the story of the king of Moab. And it's an interesting story. The king wants Israel to be cursed so that he can defeat them in battle. And Balak, Moab's king, sends messengers down to meet with this man Balaam, who is supposedly representing Jehovah, and he wants to get him to curse Israel. And Balaam tells him that God does not want Balaam to curse Israel. If you go back to verse 12, God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balak is sending his uh, representatives down to talk to Balaam and try to convince him to put a curse on the people of Israel. And when the messengers returned to Balak, he was angry and he sent out another group. Look at verses 14 and 15. And the princes of Moab rose, rose up and they went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. And Balak sent yet other, again, princes more and more honorable than they. In other words, highest level people in the political arena. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, and curse me, this people." So Balak is really upset that uh, Balaam is not doing that. He offers Balaam a promotion in verse 17. I'll promote thee unto very high honor. Uh, and then he offered to give him anything that he wanted. All he had to do was just simply curse the people of God. But Balaam was so committed to what God's word told him that he refused Balak's request, even if he were to offer him a house full of silver and gold. Now, God had warned Balaam in verse 20, the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Same warning for us today. And like Balaam, we are supposed to adhere to God's word regardless of the offers to abandon our relationship to the Lord. So the reason God doesn't take us to heaven immediately after we get saved, anybody ever ask you that question? I've had people ask me, if you know, if we're saved and going to heaven, why doesn't God just take us off this earth so we don't have to suffer, we don't have to be attacked, we don't have to be persecuted, we could just go and do whatever 
you know, God wants us to do. Heaven immediately. Why not go there if we're saved? And uh, the question has a simple answer. God wants us to live lives that glorify him. Paul says that in Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and following. He said, whether I die or whether I live, the important thing is that my life honors and glorifies the Lord. So the Apostle Paul, he put it this way as he wrote to the Philippian church from death row in Rome, chapter 1, verse 20 of Philippians. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So you and I are a soul. The real part of you isn't in this uh, treasurer's clay that you have out here, you know, this made of dust stuff here we call flesh. That's not the real you. That's just where you live temporarily. So we're living in a body. That's the tool that God gives us for glorifying him. So the way we talk, the way we look, the way we dress, the way we act, all of this is to honor and glorify God. So the question is, would a house full of silver and gold buy you? Would a house uh, full of silver and gold turn you away from church? Would a house full of silver and gold keep you from doing what God tells you to do with your life? Well, over my 65 years plus in ministry, I've seen people sell out for a lot less than a house full of silver and gold. I've seen people sell out for a job promotion that requires them to uh, work on Sundays. I've seen people sell out for 15 minute sexual flame. I've seen people sell out in order to get a $100 a week raise. I've seen people sell out because they would have more pleasant circumstances in a different situation. You know, Eve in the Garden of Eden sold out for an empty promise from the devil. Then we have the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Nothing could induce him to turn his back on God. Nothing could cause Joseph not to obey God. Balaam was faced with successive attempts to get him to sell out to the demands of of the king. Balak, the king of Moab, sent high-ranking public officials. The second time, he offered a promotion of office to Balaam again, and then Balak offered to do anything that Balaam, he said, here's a blank check. You fill it in. You tell me what you want in order to curse Israel, and I'll, I'll pay it. <laughs> I tell you, when the devil gives you a blank check, whatever you do, don't sign it. <laughs> In this last call, Balaam asked God what he should do, and God said, go with them. So the last time, God said, okay, go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do, verse 20. So this is the point that liberals contend is a contradiction. People who don't want to believe the Bible is literal, they say, see there, see there. God told him not to go, and now God tells him to go. Did God change his mind? And uh, they say that that's justification for denying what the Bible says anywhere. It appears to be, doesn't it? If you just read it without studying the context, God says, don't go. Then he says, go. Then God is angry at Balaam for going. Look at verse 22. He says, and God's anger was kindled because he went. Now, God had just told him to go with him. By the way, there's always an answer if you study the whole context. Most people just read that and say, see, contradiction. God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. So how do we explain that situation? Uh, this is the spot at which the angel of the Lord account appears, and it begins in verse 22 and goes uh, for a way. So let's, uh, let's read it. It's lengthy, but let's read it. So the two servants were with him, we're told, in verse 23. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. 
a wall being on this side, a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself under the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where it was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me. I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which I hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because the way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless he had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore... If it displease thee, I will get me back again. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Very strange occurrence here. Somebody asked me one time, Do you believe it actually occurred that way? I said, Yeah. I said, You know, if you can create a universe out of nothing, you can make an animal talk. I mean, that's no big deal, right? I mean, if you're God, you're God. Critics of the Bible will argue this way. Here's what they say. God is inconsistent. He told Balaam not to go. Then he told him to go. Then God got angry with Balaam for going. That's the argument. And by the way, you have to understand that's a circular argument. It doesn't deal with the real issue. So the questions are as follows. First of all, who is this Balaam? Why is he even supposed to be a representative of God, and, and why did all this happen this way? Well, he was actually not known to be a prophet of God. Balaam was the son of Peor, and Peor was a pagan, and Balaam obviously, according to history, had taken up divining like fortune-telling and horoscoping and all of that. Balaam lived in Pethor, probably near the Euphrates River, and there was a cult of prophets and seers in the area, and they claimed to have divine connections with all gods, including the God of Israel. Historically, they were known for being able to give both blessings and cursings. And that explains Balak's actions on this account, going to someone who historically comes from a cult that basically will curse or bless anything if they're paid enough to do so. The members of the seer cult were broad-minded, and they would seek to contact any god. You came to them and say, I want you to talk to this god, they would say they were doing it. If you came to them and said, I want to talk to Jehovah, they would say they were doing it. So the first question, who is Balaam? Now we know a little bit more about him, right? Very important to the understanding of the passage. Number two, why would Balaam seek the God of Israel? Why would he do that? Why would he turn to the Lord? Huh. And moreover, the third question we're going to look at is why would God even talk to a pagan, particularly a member of a false cult? So let's answer question two. Why would Balaam seek the God of Israel? <clears throat> well, Jehovah was widely known. All of the things that God had done in delivering his people out of Egypt, this historically had occurred over and over in communications with people. And it would be a feather in the cap of any one of the seers in this particular cult to claim that he had contact with the God who defeated Pharaoh, led Israel through the Red Sea, and defeated Israel's enemies. Well, it's a feather in my cap if I can tell people I can actually talk to that God. I hear people today say they talk to the Lord. I say it. Some of the people I hear say they talk to the Lord. Their lives don't match a conversation they would have with God. 
So his motive for calling on Jehovah is not stated. However, just from the historical study of this cult, it indicates that pride is possibly his motivation. Look at me. I can talk to the God that can open the Red Sea. So let's go to question number three. Why would God communicate to and through a pagan prophet? Bible knowledge commentary uh, comprised of men and women who have spent their entire lives studying the Bible. They suggest the following, and I'm quoting, in gracious condescension and in an anticipation of his blessing on his own people, the Lord appeared to this diviner and warned him not to heed Balak's instructions to curse God's blessed people, end of quotation. Now, some critics are going to claim this does not make sense because the false prophets are often condemned in the Bible. And that, of course, represents a biased mindset against God's word. One thing I've learned in over 65 years of serving the Lord is God doesn't consult me about what he's going to do. He does what he's going to do, and he does it in harmony with his character, and he expects me to function within that realm. God is sovereign, and as such can reveal himself to anyone he chooses. Remember, in the New Testament, he revealed himself to people who had been trying to seek him. He can choose to reveal himself to anyone, anywhere, anytime he chooses. God revealed himself to Abimelech, king of Gerar, in Abraham's time, Genesis 26 through 7. God revealed himself to Pharaoh in dreams, Genesis 41, 25 pagan king. God revealed himself to King Nebuchadnezzar in dreams and visions, Daniel 4, 1 through 18. And Bible knowledge commentary reminds us, quote, as the sovereign God, he overrules and rules in prophetic revelation as well as in all of the other areas of life. End of quotation. So while God accommodated himself to the crass manipulation of the Amorite diviner, Balaam, he at that same time would show that he was always in control. So questions by investigators of this passage are easily answered if you look at the context in which everything occurs. And then if you take other places in which the word of God comments on similar events of this. So question one, who is Balaam? He is a diviner associated with an Amorite cult of seers, people that would be like uh, horoscopers and things like that. Number two, why would Balaam seek Jehovah? Could have been pride. If I can reach the God of Israel who has been done all of these things, it'll be a feather in my cap and my cult. Number three, why would God use Balaam? And the answer is God decides when, where, why, and how to reveal himself. One of the most amazing passages in the Bible is found in the book of Daniel where God raises up Nebuchadnezzar to take his people into captivity because they have refused to repent of their idolatry. And God says to Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. Think about that. And then after Nebuchadnezzar had brought the people of Israel into captivity in three separate deportations, 606, 597, 587 BC. Then God raised up four nations to come against Nebuchadnezzar and take him down. One of the greatest lessons I've ever learned is God doesn't consult me for what he does. <laughs> There's also another concern by our critics. Number four, why would God tell Balaam to go with these men and then be angry because Balaam actually did so? You see, God is concerned about our internal motive as he is about our external motive. One of the chief differences between Old Testament law and New Testament teachings of Christ is simply this. The Old Testament law imposed penalties on outward conduct. Jesus talked to people about changing 
their inner condition so that the outward conduct would match the inner condition. The Old Testament law said that if somebody was taken in adultery, that person should be stoned. Jesus said lying, deception, fornications, adultery, all of these things come out of a man's heart. Jesus says change the heart, you'll change the conduct. Franklin Graham put on Facebook recently, he said, our problem is not political parties. Our problem is we've turned from God. If we don't get our inner man right with God, our country will be affected by that. So why would God tell Balaam to go? God gave Balaam permission to go with the men to meet Balaam. However, we have to go to the New Testament thousands of years later. Get this thousands of years later, to find out why God was angry with Balaam. If you study the context, and I read it through about 50 times, it doesn't say anything in the context about the motive of Balaam. Not anything at all. So you ask yourself the question, why in the world did he do this? Well, if you go to the New Testament, thousands of years later, and you go to 2 Peter, by the way, 2 Peter comes right after 1 Peter in our Bible. You knew that, right? But if you go to 2 Peter, it's an interesting passage, chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. He talks back, uh, he's talking about people who have, you know, have their eyes full of adultery, they won't see from sin, beguiling unstable souls. In verse 15 he picks up, he says, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with a man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. So we know the way of Balaam is defined here as loving the wages of unrighteousness. So the wealth did get to him. Did you know that you can do the sinful thing and profit from it financially? Look at the pornography industry, multiples of billions of dollars. Look at the liquor industry, multiples of billions of dollars. So you can, you can sin and profit financially. You can't sin and profit spiritually because at the end of what this world offers, it's the great white throne judgment. We're also told that his wrong motive was the reason for the angel of the Lord in the donkey story. The angel appeared to him because of his wrong motive. The implication is if he had simply done what God told him to do for the right reason, he may not have had to have his foot crushed against a wall by a dumb ass. Actually, if you read the context, my black preacher friend tells me, he said, that ass smarter than that prophet. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus, just knowing God's word completely answers a lot of confusing questions, but sometimes you have to read the whole Bible to get an answer in one place. By the way, are you almost done with your Bible reading for the year? We start again in January, you know. Yeah, I've only got a few chapters and I'll be done with mine. Dr. John McCormick, who preached here years ago, said, young preachers, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. So that it appears that Balaam's declaration that a house full of silver and gold would not entice him to go up to Balak was not totally true. Because according to Peter, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, he saw wages in unrighteousness. One of my preacher friends told me the other day, he said, if you were to take the prophet the financial profit out of pornography it would disappear. If you were to take the financial profit out of liquor, it would disappear. As Paul said to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. He never said money was the root of all evil. Money's an inanimate object. It's the love of it, what it can gain for you. The Holy Spirit directed Peter to write much later that Balaam's way included a desire for the wages which had been offered to him by Balak. So the question of the hour 
is this. What's your price? What's my price? What would we sell out for? What would it take for us to drop out of church? What would it take to get us to close our Bibles permanently and say, I no longer believe this book? What would it take to get us to exclude God from our family? What would it take to get us to turn our backs on the Savior who loved us, left heaven's glory, was incarnate, went to the cross and died for our sins and rose again and ascended to heaven? What would it take to turn our back on that kind of Savior? Remember this. What you sell out for is no bargain if it breaks fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. We'll stand together for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we love you. We thank you for the word of God and how it cuts across our circumstances, our weaknesses, our rebellion, every aspect of us that will turn against you. We pray that as we look at this story and we think about a house full of silver and gold. Help us to realize Jesus said, if you lay up treasures on this earth, those treasures will eventually decay. But if you lay up treasures in heaven, those treasures will, of course, grow and will magnify themselves and manifest themselves to you in eternity. Help us, Lord, to realize that eternity is actually more real than the life we're now living. And if we need to come this morning for salvation or some other need, may this be the moment we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. What page? 387. 387. God spoke into your heart. If you need to come for any reason, the altar is open. <laughs>
Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and then Paul, lead us in prayer, please.